more chaos. Uh, so, buenos, buenos dias, uh, everyone. Good morning. My name is Tom Gerard. I'd just like to start by uh, thanking everyone who was instrumental in making this happen, like the university for hosting it. I'd like to thank uh, uh, everyone who's been a part of Transplanted Roots all along, Ayun, Steve, uh, Vanessa Tomlinson, and a great big thank you to Ivan, who came and put me up in the middle of the night a few months ago. So yeah, this is, there's been a whole amount of work on to it, and um, so I acknowledge that. So today I'm going to talk about the influence non-drummers have had on the direction of drums in, in popular music, and in particular music producers. Uh, next slide, please. So the rationale, what sort of informed this research, is uh, it's based on findings around DAWs, which are which is short for Digital Audio Workstation, and that, that's really the kind of thing that I'm looking at here is music created using these DAWs. So things like Pro Tools or Ableton Live, which is what I'm using today. So this first paper here, uh, Music Composition Lessons, uh, is looking at the multimodal applications that you can have in composition uh, with, with technology. That was, a, that was a big part of, of what I've been interested in lately and what's been guiding my research. Now Mark Merrington uh, took that a step further into specifically digital audio workstation technology and he's, <coughs> this particular paper of his is looking at how uh, compositional how compositional work can be conceptualised through specifically <coughs> DAWs. Now Watkins work into visual music has informed my own ideas and research into the physiological and the cognitive and emotional effects of perceived liveness in music. This is this third paper. So looking at uh, sequenced versus live performance. Uh, and this research also stems from a paper that I wrote last year and presented. Uh, that was looking at the echoes, if you like, of jazz music and modern pop music and uniquely jazz traits such as improvisation and micro subdivision, that kind of thing, that you can now hear in pop music. There was an interesting one, and that sort of ended up going naturally into this topic as well. Uh, we can move on, and then back in again. Sorry for the back and forth with the presentation there. I sort of put it in the clicker, but it's all good. So I guess the real rationale for this study is to try and understand the relationship between sequenced and live drums, and to explore how the two may work together and kind of a preemptive uh, take on, on what's becoming commonplace in mainstream music. So like most things, innovation in pop music drumming has come from experimentation and innovation. And until the technology allowed it to be otherwise, this was always the domain of like, experienced practitioners, drummers who know the instrument, knew how it reacted, um, you know, physically how it reacted, knew what they should play when, and music producers who understood how drums should support their role in the song and that kind of thing, more holistic view. So a wonderful example of this is a track that we all know and love well. It's, it's Thriller uh, from Michael Jackson, uh, sorry, B uh, Billy Jean from Michael Jackson's 1982 Thriller. Uh, next slide. Where this pattern, you know, you can hear the influences from Motown and Blues in it. It's not like it was like a wholly original pattern, but the delivery and the intent um, set the scene in a lot of ways for what has become 90% of the, the rhythmic foundation for pop music, or you know, upwards of 90% of the rhythmic foundation of pop music. So we have, obviously, to explain it to you guys, but the, the kick drum performing one function, uh, often synchronising with the bass, the snare drum providing the back beat on two and four, and the regular, the regular subdivision that the hi-hat normally provides. In this case, it's here the regular quavers. <coughs> Sorry, next slide, next slide, and then back in, back in again. Yeah, so probably one of the earlier examples of non-drummers having kind of an autonomous uh, take on, on how drums should be used was when sampling became popular in the 80s. This is in, in, in mainstream music, and sampling became popular in the, in the 80s with people like Mick Master, Mike and, and Chuck D. And it was a really golden time for sample-based hip-hop music. Uh, it was an important step in musical production because it allowed musically minded people with no formal training to orchestrate and create, but also because it allowed for a reinterpretation of existing music. 
um, which was abundant, and meaning that there were almost no limitations around what couldn't what couldn't be sampled. There was next to no legislation around that. It's you know pretty pretty tightly signed up now. There's a lot of uh, precedents for for some how and when samples can be used. Uh, next slide. So this one, this is just a little bit of a look at how these producers may have approached sampling a particular breakbeat pattern to use in their work. Um, this is a recreation through, well they would have used what's called a, an MPC or a, on turntables back in the 80s. This is using a, a DAW, so this is a look at Ableton Live and how, how producers would have started sampling these breakbeats. Should have audio. Maybe we'll start sounding great. Channel 30. Process where the yellow markers are what they call warm markers beacons. You can stretch the audio to fit within a grid. Switching it so it's the right, the right length, one or two bars long, and they they have the ability to to just chop it up and, and duplicate parts. So often it would sound very um, not like how a person would approach the drum set. In a way, it was reinterpreting how how the drums, uh, how the rhythmic foundation of hip hop was working during the eighties, as well. And of course, with drum and bass and that kind of stuff, it's a very popular way of doing it. With the introduction of the the, the Lin LM1 drum machine in the early 80s, this was now becoming the age of sequencing drums. So what you can see here is uh, is what they would call sequencing drums, drawing them into a, a grid, um, a piano, a, a matrix, uh, people call it. And when, in the 1980s, what we began to see was an abundance of this sort of sequence drumming in mainstream music. So DAWs began to adopt this format and gradually built on it to accommodate micro subdivision and multi sampling, which is using multiple samples in the one in the one uh, MIDI note. So one of these might might be triggering several different samples at the same time, giving the user an almost like almost endless options with regards to what and how the drums sound like. DAWs are geared towards experimentation. And this in turn has led to innovation that significantly altered the function of drum set parts compared to when this process was dictated by actual performers. So you can see from this image that really it's not necessarily physical parameters that's dictating how they approach it, but more the grid, the grid base. And so for example, where the hi-hat was once the regular subdivision provider, what you often hear these days in, in pop music and mainstream music is the hi-hat as a means of humanizing the track against what's a highly quantized uh, kick and snare drum part. So often these hi-hat parts are, are played in um, on, on an MPC by the producer to, to give it a more sort of organic human quality. So we can hear that in the next slide, which is a track, just a short snippet of a song called Letters by Matt Miller. <laughs> Next 
slide. And the next one again. So some key aspects here. I want to look at this, this word of embodied, like embodiment when it comes to instrumentation. Um, of course, but yeah, of course, of course this, this is with regards to a listener, embodied music cognition, but as we all know, it applies to embodied performance and embodied composition as well. And, you know, I think for most people, that's the obvious disadvantage of, of sequencing drums and that kind of thing. Like there's no uh, embodiment. You know, the, the perception is that there's no embodiment. And it can have its good points and its bad points. This innovation is, is, has happened because of the lack of limitations, the lack of physical limitations around sequencing drums. But by the same time, a lot of beginner digital composers start off without understanding quite how drums should be approached. So there's a lot of non-musical drum parts sequenced as well. Um, it's a bit of a process getting there. Uh, the next slide. So according to Prensky, a digital native feels more at ease while immersed in computer technology. We started touching on this yesterday at the round table just a little bit. So it's important to understand this because often modern composers, particularly those who direct innovation in sequence drums and mainstream music, are digital natives who understand creative possibilities that may be afforded through computer technology. This is important to acknowledge in the education sector, where digital natives can thrive from being expressive, what they, what they want to do, uh, through technology, which is kind of what they know. Because music technology moves so quickly, curriculum, at least in New Zealand, <coughs> often has a hard time keeping up with it. And it's important to not alienate these students whose only musical experience is with these kind of processes, but they still identify as musicians. Uh, next slide. So Hugo takes this further in the digital musician. Um, and he incorporates into musicianship and has built into a digital musician profile. And so what he's getting at here is that one becomes a digital musician when they're uh, composing or performing using only those things which can uniquely be afforded by the through digital means. So this kind of begs the question, but does someone need to be proficient at playing acoustic drums and percussion to identify and be labelled as a percussionist? Or does someone just need to express themselves through percussive sounds? This is an interesting question. Uh, next slide. And then again. So yes, yeah, to sum things up, what does this mean for acoustic drum set players? What does it mean to not have a visual presence live? Due to the accessibility of computers and the programs and the popularity of the style, sequence drum parts are now requiring more advanced drum set specialists when they take this sequence drumming to the live performance arena. Uh, as drum sampling once mimicked human players, now aspects of the sequence vernacular have become mainstays of modern drum set technique that are incorporated into mainstream music. So this can be observed now where, because the sequence parts are quite complicated, they can be complicated because the, the composer has, or the producer has, you know, not approached it from a physical point of view. Often they require someone, a drummer with more advanced technical ability. So there are more jazz players now, which is kind of like a technical uh, a technical, which, which demands quite a lot of technique. There, there are, it can be observed in players like Mark Giuliani, uh, who plays for, who's a great jazz player, but also played on Dave Bowie's Black Star album. Uh, we're through Chris Dave, who plays for acts like D'Angelo, and uh, also a fantastic jazz drummer. And also Brian Blade, who uh, is a, my favorite jazz drummer, incredible player, but also he, he plays for Joni Mitchell. <clears throat> So as the as DAW technology develops and new AI based of, uh, sorry, and new AI based ways of creating are emerging, which are almost indiscernible from performed drums, what does this mean for drum set players? Uh, so I have no doubt that there will always be a place for live perform music. However, one possibility is that what becomes normal drum parts may actually involve an unhuman aesthetic, effectively writing out a live player. So another much more likely scenario. Um, is that tools will and are evolving to integrate sequencing into live performance to a degree that the nature of live performance itself changes and that purely acoustic drums may become the exception in, the, in commercial mainstream music. So I'm going to play a piece for you guys which is, uh, it's called Kindred, 
which is a reference to, I guess, how the sequence drums and the line drums are in the same family. And basically, it's, it's a series of, of loops uh, in which the relationship between live drums and sequence drums are explored the unique traits of each of them. So what I've been discussing with sequence drums and what I haven't had time to go into about acoustic drums, but you guys would, would all know those things. Uh, these, these traits uh, are reversed and they play together and that kind of thing. So it's, it's an exploration of
Thank you.